I am Ghanaian. I was born in Dublin, but never lived there. And uh, I moved to Ghana as a child, as a baby, actually. My, my, my mother wanted to continue going to school, so she sent me to Ghana. So I got breastfed by her twin sister. When she finally arrived two years later, I refused to go to her because I didn't know her. But since then, I've reformed. <laughs> I think so. OK, um, I went to school in Ghana, went to infant swim school in Cape Coast in Ghana. And then um, I uh, lived in Sierra Leone a bit. Then went to school in America. Went to high school for a year and college for four years in Texas. Regular African kid, nothing special, average student, you know, um, a bit gangster. <laughs> you know, so my parents sent me to Texas to cool me down. And uh, I arrived in Texas as a teenager. <coughs> Took, took one look around and realized that, wait a minute, this country, the people, is some, some, sort, some sort of pigmentocracy. With the kind of color skin I had, the classification I was being put in, it was going to make my life a little difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, like uh, my friend Kwame, I read the Malcolm X book, and that was it. I understood, <laughs> I understood where they were coming from. I wasn't angry, but because thankfully I had somewhere to go back to. But it focused me, I got very serious about school. Uh, in five years, I was ready to leave. Finished university, left three, uh, three weeks after, after leaving. It took three weeks to pack my stuff into six boxes, and I moved to London. And uh, I worked here for uh, 18 months or 15 months or something as a manufacturing engineer in Oxbridge. And then uh, left this country too. Actually, I went for holidays, looking to come back uh, and, then, and then go back again. But I got into an argument uh, because I was drinking with some friends in a pub who were my classmates who had just finished school and were asking me to help them to get to America. And I told them, you guys were crazy. You guys are crazy. I mean, I'm trying to come back. You're trying to go. I said, there are no jobs here. I said, how? This, 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 I did my Ghanaian thing. How? How? <laughs> this is this, uh, this, uh, Ghana with open sewers, mosquitoes. And this is all business opportunity. And they said I was crazy. They thought I'd be eating too many hamburgers. And they were going to my head. So um, we made a bet. And uh, while I was in London, I would quit working. Uh, out of the blue, my boss was confused. I just told him, stop, I'm ready to go to Africa. So, so in, the, <laughs> in the three months or so that uh, I was hanging around here, I started, I bought a computer. Somebody lent me 800 pounds when I first came. And I paid him back. And I got a computer and tinkering with it. So I'd learned some programming. So I started doing two things. I, become, I realized I had an aptitude for it. I studied manufacturing, but uh, I was programming for fun. So. I uh, had done some work for a travel agent on Oxford Street, just writing programs to, to do the booking system, something very simple. And then I taught uh, programming students on Oxford Street. So when I had this argument with my friends, I told them I could get a job on, by Monday. This was Saturday, I think. I said, get a job by Monday. And they said, it's impossible. You're, now you're crazy. And so we said we put $500 on it. And everybody was excited because they were sure they were going to win. So uh, I woke up the next morning, on Monday morning, my, my head was clear now. There was no more drinks. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, uh, mm, I have a problem. I need to get a job, like today. So I started calling my friends, and I went out to meet people and asked them, hey, guys, I was thinking of what I could do to, to win this argument, or to win the, the money. And they said, uh, they said there was a travel agency they wanted to introduce me to, so I could go and talk to them. And uh, once again, my theory worked that being black in Ghana was not a crime, unlike other places. I walked into the place. Uh, the, the manager came out. Yes, can I help you? I said yes, no problem. And I said, Sir, you have your computer. I saw the computer was nice and covered. You know, in those days, in 1990, 1991, the computer was sealed. Nobody do not touch. <laughs> and, uh, it was in the boss's office. So everybody pointed. There's one there. If you peek, you can see it. And, uh, so the waiter for the boss, he came. Thankfully, you know, I was not offensive in my looks and my appearance. He sat with me, and he spoke to me, and I said I could, I could, I could, use the, I could do programming on his computer, and I could make it work for him. And he said, uh, he says, OK, young man, come back tomorrow. If you think you're that good, you come tomorrow. Next day, I gathered all the work I had done on diskettes in those days. I arrived at his office. Halfway through, somebody called him aside, and then he ran back in. Young man, I want you to promise me one thing. I said, what is it? I will be very angry. You have to promise you don't put any bacteria on my computer. <laughs> oh, virus. 
So say, I, I promise I won't. <laughs> so somebody just told me that these programmers have been putting bacteria on people's computers. <laughs> but uh, we became very good friends. And needless to say, I did the work. And then he told me immediately that, ah, I know your trick. You got this from London from the company you used to work for, and you brought it here. But there are things missing. You see, this part is not applicable to Ghana, and there's no VAT in Ghana yet. So I said, sorry, good try, but we need somebody who can actually write the process. I said, I wrote these programs. He said, look, you don't need to lie to me. I've seen people like you before. And thankfully, I brought the whole programming environment. So he said, give me five minutes. I installed everything. He said, sir, what do you want to change? This part, I'll make the whole screen change to blue. And I'll, I'll change this to mean, what's your name? And I'll put it there. As soon as I did that, ah, the office exploded. He shouted, hey, guys, he can do it. And everybody ran to me. The accounts department wanted this. The, the HR wanted that. And basically, it locked me down in Ghana for months and months and months. And uh, I only left to come back to the UK like six months later to do a quick run for three or four days to pick up my stuff and go back. And I've lived in Ghana ever since. And I got the $500 from my friends, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, now, the next thing I did after that was, now we had the basis for setting up a software company. I studied manufacturing, I had no money. My parents didn't particularly want me in Ghana because they didn't live there. And they thought I was going to cause trouble, like the old days. So <laughs> they didn't want me there. It was a military government in power. And they just didn't want me to be their representative there. They thought I was going to be trouble. So, I had to do everything by myself. They allowed me the use of my bedroom, which I grew up in, you know, where, I, where I lived on as a child. So uh, we had that one computer I brought from London. And once we had this contract going, I hooked up with an old classmate and, uh, who, who still lived in Ghana, and uh, we worked together. So he was doing the sales and I was doing the programming. We were doing the sales together. And we started selling the software, the other travel agencies and so on. And we were making, I had made heavy modifications to what I had done in London. So it became very sophisticated. We pulled out a point of sale system out of it. So suddenly, over the next couple of years, maybe 60, 70% of the point of sale installations in Ghana are running off stuff we did. And we started doing our friends' poultry farms, uh, construction companies. A lot was pent up demand for, for people who could program. Then we started hiring people. Then I started training. And thankfully, I started manufacturing. And we were taught all the manufacturing techniques, the assembly line stuff, and so on. So we didn't, a few other software companies sprang up around that time. We survived the best because I was head of technical and my mindset was factory. My mindset wasn't craftsmanship. So we set up such that we could pick somebody off the street and within a month he's doing pretty effective work. That's what the other company, you have to be a little gangster. What the other companies <laughs> suffered from was that they were hiring top notch computer programmers, internationally qualified. One, they were expensive, we all didn't have money then. Two, on a whim, they could walk up to the US Embassy, yeah, US Embassy, get a visa and go and work for Oracle. And that's what they were doing. So none of their projects were finishing. I would happily take my, my, uh, my ex-girlfriend's delinquent younger brother. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice, uh, Ajebota, his English is good. He just smoked a little too, many, too much weed. <laughs> and, and now he has reformed. And his, his math was very good in the days when he was in school. I will take him on, I will train him. And so I had a whole fleet of very unconventional, quirky young people who were extremely arrogant and rich and thought they, they knew everything about everything. And, and I, I, saw, I had to mentor also, because um, a lot of our people were also arriving with a rote learning culture, uh, whereby the, the, the thinking doesn't come naturally. And I argue that it's a combination of extreme religious belief and, and ex extreme African culture. The two cause children to be you know, put in a corner and they can't really ask questions. So a lot of people I was recruiting and in a creative scientific environment, it's, it's, it's very difficult to work with such people. They have to be, the conversion has to be done. It's like how you take a, in the old days, they take an African and convert him into a slave by dehumanizing him. You have to rehumanize. <laughs> you have to do it the other way around so that they will learn to ask questions, they learn to, to have an opinion and defend their opinion. And, 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 and rules and regulations didn't come from an older person imposing it on, on you and that kind of thing. We had to teach them all that. We did this very well. Our turnover doubled every year. And we won plenty of awards all over the place. And then uh, we started working with the multinationals because now the Nestle's and the Guinnesses and the Unilever's and so on, we were the only show in town. We were doing everybody's work. And uh, we ended up with like 70 people in, in, a, in a software company in West Africa, which we thought was quite good. 
And uh, we were doing very well. But then two things happened. The mobile telephones came, which was wonderful news. Then the internet came, which was even better news. While we were beginning to innovate on the internet, we started losing our multinational contracts. Because suddenly, the same mindset that technology, you're buying technology from Africa. In the old days, there was no internet. They had to use us, right? As soon as technology changed, Hi Herman, head office says we must all use SAP. Finish. So we were losing out on our business. In one of our company, one of the multinationals, I won't mention the name, the workers and the management in Ghana, a big, big multinational, you all know them, refused to switch systems for two and a half years after the instruction came because they were so much more comfortable using our systems because we were tuned for the environment. So we designed them to be very easy. We're Africans. We know the challenges of our people, so we know how to design things that are intuitive to our people. But then we had to, so our, com our company started dwindling. We're not making as much uh, money as we, we were making, so we had to rethink the whole thing. So uh, two things happened. Um, we went back to the lab, on, on my, my software company, Softribe, went back to the lab in the new landscape to innovate and come up with new products. We set up something called shopafrica53.com, which is like a web mall for, for like an eBay style thing. And Africa had a big problem because mobile payments and payments that lend themselves to the internet and e-commerce didn't exist. They still don't, still kind of don't exist. So we had, we had I designed one, uh, which if we got some funding, we could set up, I could set up another company which could implement that. For me, what drove me was, you know, I'm a proud African, I'm also arrogant. You can't be arrogant and your people are poor. It just doesn't work. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a pose that, it's, not, it's a hollow pose. It doesn't work. That everybody has to look good. My Weibo friends come to visit me in Ghana. If we're driving through and see some poor people, you know, it's not very sexy. <laughs> so, so we have to fix it. You, you can't win unless you're winning with people coming behind you. This is my, my mentality. Okay. OK, I'm going to try and wind up. Now, so running this operation, you see the work is exciting, and we think it's going to allow me to continue with my arrogance so it won't be hollow, because now the people are going to start making money. I mean, if you think about it, uh, all I need to do is to achieve a situation where like one million people in my country uh, make $1,000 a month. That's it. That's more than the World Bank has done in 50 years. <laughs> yeah. and, yeah. and, and, and it's, it's configured, it's configured to go to shopafrica53.com. We're going to go into 53 countries. I just came, my, my, the, our Ugandan partner, our East Africa partners from Uganda, just left, finished negotiating with us uh, last week in my office. We signed the contracts. They are going to roll out like how they do TEDx. Because we're bringing everybody to speed, the merchants, the, students, the financial institutions, boom, delays. So the investment money we had finished. We had to fix this problem Africa style. What came out of the thinking? was some, some argue it's even more exciting than Shop Africa. The first thing that came out of the thinking was this. It's called a Kebaikon card. Do you know what it is? It's an e-event card. We have the cloud. It's sitting. We wrote software around the platform, our, our MX platform we wrote for the Shop Africa payments. We wrote software around it such that uh, when there's a, a music concert in Ghana, 10,000 people, they use this card. Why? You can't steal the money. <laughs> There's no way to steal the money. If you buy it from a gas station uh, for, what, let's say, $5 for the concert, suddenly concerts are being scheduled nicely. It's online on our system. They can log on and schedule, and then the, the sales agents can uh, sell. Uh, when they give you the, the card the first time, it's not a throwaway card. When you take it the first time, you keep it. You don't throw it away. When you get to the, when you get to the concert, uh, you and your, and your wife or your girlfriend, so now suddenly it's dignified. Blim, blim, on the scanner, $20 scanner. Wait, checking. Checks on the cloud. Enter now. You're in. No queue, no fight. So people are putting up signs. Tickets not sold at the gate. Finish. Because they don't want the fights that normally is used. Right? So you have to go back somewhere else. So the first test of this was with the Ghana Trade Fair Authority. They have an, an international trade. I met the Nigerians there, actually. The Nigerian trade, they were fascinated. One, there was no queue. For once, I have to say something good about the Western immigration. You see those, those, those lines they do that go sideways like this? Ah, we saw, I realized why they did that. You can't push. If you push, you're pushing the wrong way. You're pushing <laughs> perpendicular, to, perpendicular to London. 
So we, we set that up and put these, these little kids that work with us, fresh out of fresh fish out of university. This thing that had been a big problem historically, people are fighting at the gates, people die, people are jumping the gate, there are police shooting guns, soldiers have been brought in because all the area boys are trying to get into the trade fair. This year's trade fair, no fights, no money lost. For the first time, the trade fair made over 500% increase in revenue. On one of the days, they made more money than any trade fair event has made since the 60s. Why? Because we set it up on this card. So you come in, you get to the gate, you are ready to negotiate. Say, oh boy, can I do this? And this? there's nobody to talk to. It's a scanner. <laughs> 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 you can't bribe a scanner. Now, second issue. Go on. Second issue, most interesting, the trade fair authorities sat upstairs. Very, very interesting. These are the same guys who said, we make a loss each time, but government will give us subvention and they will help us. Said, it's not necessary, you watch. By the way, they didn't pay, they didn't pay us anything. We we're so sure we said, we'll do revenue split. But they, they sat upstairs, we gave them a link to our server, and they just sat and watched. And every now and then, every now and then they called, hello, Herman, Herman, yeah, I noticed there's uh, 7,000 cities in the last two hours. Could you bring it upstairs? Because they could see all the transactions. <laughs> One night, uh, we actually had a bit of a tussle. They said the person who was supposed to sign out, our part wasn't there. And, and uh, we, br we brought the security. They didn't, they didn't bring anything. We brought the security. I said, sir, I don't think you understand. We control security here. If we can't do the split now, I'm lifting the money. We are taking it to our office. You come chase us for it tomorrow. He said, he said he's coming. <laughs> okay. and, uh, very quickly, the other one we did was an insurance card. Now you can, uh, we did this with an insurance company, same modeling thing. So now if you live here, your car can be parked in, in your garage. It's not insured. The day you take off, you go to Ghana or Nigeria, wherever, you jump in the car, around the first corner, excuse me, could you give me MTN top up? Good, so so Naira. Could you also give me third party insurance? Scratch in your phone, boom, car number, policy number, covered. We did that too, so that's happening. And the third one we did, which is launching next week, is the most interesting to me, it's an anti-arm robbery product. <laughs> get ready, get ready, get ready. This is the wildest one. This is the, I found this the most exciting. It's called Hage Law. In Nigeria, it will be Ole. <laughs> you thief. And here's how it works. Basically, you, if for ten, like $10 a month, we've set up a system in place where if you get attacked, you, you're holding one of five phones in your house that can call for help by either sending a blank text or flashing a number. You know what flashing means. I know it's not English, but flash is when you call and nobody picks up. You just flash a local number that talks to our server, the same old cloud server. The server turns around and starts a dance. Basically, the security, our security company partners are in, in a matter of five minutes, <laughs> they'll be in your house because they've parked in anticipation of they parked vehicles all over the ground. They will be in your house with noise, with dogs, with whatever. That's level one. Line two. We will alert 10 of your neighbors within 20 seconds. 10 of your neighbors are aware there's a robbery going on in Ghana. What that means is that people are releasing their dogs, lights are coming on, some guy across the road is shooting a gun in the air. You, you, can't, you can't conduct a robbery in that environment. The third line is that, remember our friends from the radio station? They're in on this gig too. Guess what their job is? Today, the president visited Kumasi. Sorry, sorry, there's a robbery. There seems to be a house under attack. <laughs> right? So, and you know, in, in Ghana at least, when a thief comes to your house, it's not the police they fear, it's the mob action they're about to receive from the neighbors. That's what they fear. So it's, we, find, we think it will be very effective. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish now. So there's plenty more, so let's stop. So uh, we're, working, we're looking for partners in other African countries. So if anybody's interested in partnering on any of these products, called the cloud, you can talk to Ghana as, as well as Sierra Leone, as well as Uganda, as well as whatever. I think I've talked enough, I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.